In lesson two, we'll continue with some geometry review. Now, lesson one was extremely long. I'm going to kind of simplify this lesson a little bit. If you want to read more detailed information, then you can read what it has in the book starting on page 14. I'm mainly going to focus on the formulas that we use to calculate area and volume. And all of these formulas, you should use or you should write these in your spiral notebook that you're keeping. Remember, that's like your toolbox that you have. It's your toolbox that you use to solve your mathematical problems. A fundamental thing to think about when you're talking about area is the units of area. It's always a length times a length. You're always multiplying two distances or lengths together, and that gives you length squared. Just like an x times an x would be x squared, right? 3 times 3 is 3 squared. You're always multiplying one length times another to get units of length squared. For example, if you had a rectangle, and let's just break that up into squares. And we have six squares there. And let's say each one of those squares was one centimeter by one centimeter. Well, there's six of them, so we would say six centimeters squared. Or we might write the words square centimeters out. Now, we could also figure that out by multiplication, right? Two centimeters is one side times three centimeters, that's the length of the other, that gives us six square centimeters as well. Centimeter times centimeter gives us centimeter squared. So the area of a rectangle, a rectangle has perpendicular sides, right? That's equal to the length, we'll just call that L, times the width, W. The area of a triangle that equals the length of its base, B, times its height perpendicular to the base. Let's put a little perpendicular symbol like an upside down T to remember that that's how we figure out the area of a triangle. The base times the height perpendicular to that base divided by 2. Or we could say 1 half the base times the height. Either way. And just remember, think about this. Here's a rectangle. We could split that with a diagonal, and we end up with two triangles, right? So if the area of that whole rectangle was the length times the width, the area of one of those triangles would just be the length times the width divided by two. We just use different names for the sides. I mean, we could still say length times width divided by two, or in a triangle, we usually just consider the bottom side the base and then the, the height perpendicular to that as H, B and H. Now, look at this triangle. We'd call this side the base B, and then the height perpendicular to the base is that distance right there. So you have to be careful on triangles. They'll always give you in the book and on your test that height perpendicular to the base if it's not readily apparent that that angle right there, like on that first triangle that we drew, we could assume that is a right angle there. We put that right angle box there to designate it. And that means that height is perpendicular to the base. But if you have a triangle where that's not the case, you look for that perpendicular height drawn out to the side of the triangle. Now let's talk about cylinders and prisms. Talk about their volumes and surface areas. And first let's draw a few examples of some right and oblique cylinders and prisms. There's a mathematical definition for a cylinder in your book, and it deals with a line called a directrix and a given line that follows that directrix path. Actually, it's a curve called a directrix and a line that follows that, and then two planes intersecting that surface that is cut out. That's how you get a solid mathematically. Cylinders their bases are curves, closed curves, like a circle, for example. That's usually what we think of when we think about a cylinder. It doesn't have to be a circle, though. It could be a shape like that, and that can still be considered a cylinder. Now, in drafting, if we were trying to draw, let's say we were trying to draw a can for manufacturing of that can and we wanted to show all of the parts to it 
we would put a dashed line here to show that hidden edge and we could do it on this one too to show where that hidden edge is. Now compare those right cylinders to the oblique cylinders I'm going to draw. See oblique cylinders their bases are closed curves but their sides are not perpendicular to the bases. Just like a right angle the sides are perpendicular. A right cylinder the sides are perpendicular. Now prisms, a right prism, their bases, the only difference is that their bases are polygons. And that means that their sides are line segments in other words. So there's a right prism, there's one example of one. I mean it could have four sides, it could have any number of sides for the bases because that's what polygon means, right? Many sides. It's not just one particular side that it could have. And oblique prisms would just be like oblique cylinders, except they have polygons for their bases. Their sides are not perpendicular though. That's the difference. Just like an oblique cylinder, oblique prism, the sides are not perpendicular to the bases. Now we see cylinders and prisms all the time. Think of cans, pipes, boxes. A mailbox would be a type of cylinder. It's a closed curve for bases. And whether they're built by hand or by a machine, we must know how big to make them. How much surface do they have? How much volume do they have? God has given us mathematics as a tool to make these things. The unbendable rules or formulas that we use, those allow us to mass produce things like aluminum cans. So in the manufacturing of aluminum cans, there's the formula that I put at the top right that has to be used in order to calculate volume and design that can. The volume is equal to the area of the base times the height perpendicular to the base. Similar thoughts there with a triangle, right? The triangle's area is equal to the base times the height perpendicular to the base. So on a right cylinder or prism, the side is the same thing as the height perpendicular to a base. On an oblique cylinder or prism, we have to know this distance right here, perpendicular to the base, in order to calculate the volume for that oblique cylinder. So just think about it. Deductive reasoning is applied in the manufacture of a cylindrical shape like a can, like an aluminum Coke can. That's the application of that rule. Volume equals area of the base times the height perpendicular to it. Now just think about this though. How did they come up with that formula? Volume equals area of the base times the height perpendicular. Who made up that formula? Well they had to use inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is the process of making a rule. That's kind of what science is about. You observe things and people have observed the physical world and relationships that go on in the physical world. And over time, as they see this formula applied over and over again, it becomes a rule. We, we see that it's an unbendable rule, that the volume of a cylinder or a prism, whether it's right or oblique, it's always equal to the area of the base times the height perpendicular to the base. It's something we can always count on as being true. Now, the application of that, that's where we are imperfect at. As hard as we might try to make a can, of a certain volume will always be a little bit off of what we want it to be just because of the error that's involved there. We can never be totally perfect. So that's how you find the volume of a cylinder or a prism. Area of its base times the height perpendicular to the base. Now let's talk about something called lateral surface area. Real quick before we start that, just one thing I want to make sure you understand is the units for volume are length cubed, whether it's centimeters cubed, inches cubed, whatever. Area is always length squared. Volume is length cubed. Now let's go and talk about lateral surface area. So we're talking about area again. We're talking about units of length squared. That means we need to multiply one length by another. A good way to understand lateral surface area is just to think about a roll of paper towel. 
You can even go get a roll of paper towel if you want to and just unroll one sheet of that paper towel and you unroll it and tear it off what do you end up with usually a rectangle or square shape right but it was wrapped around that roll of paper towel it may not have wrapped around one time exactly but somewhere around there depending on the size of the paper towel roll at the time pretend like it that rectangle shape that I have there wrapped around exactly one time around that roll. That's the surface area, the surface area around the sides. Lateral means side. So we could calculate the surface area, the lateral surface area for a cylinder if we know the perimeter around it times that height. So this would be like the perimeter P times the height H. Let's write down a rule or a formula. I'll call it LSA, lateral surface area, is equal to the perimeter times the height. And again, we'll put that little perpendicular symbol to make you remember it's the height perpendicular to that perimeter. One other thing to think about, a lot of times you'll be asked to find the total surface area of a prism or a cylinder and what you need to remember there if you're asked to find the total surface area is remember that you have two bases a top and bottom base so the total I'll just say TSA is equal to 2 times the area of the base since you have two bases plus the lateral surface area that would give you the total surface area of that object Think about, there's lots of reasons why you might need to know that. And, uh, one important one is, say you were painting something. Say you are painting a deck outside. You just got finished making a deck off of your back door. And you needed to paint it. Well, you want to know how much paint to get. It would be kind of wasteful if you got 10 cans too many or something. You could calculate the surface area of that deck. And all paint cans, they'll tell you how much coverage how much surface area that can of paint will cover so that way you can tell how many cans of paint to buy write down these formulas for the volume of a cylinder or a prism you don't want to put those pictures like I have in that little table there to help you remember what a right and oblique cylinder and prism are and the lateral surface area formula write that one down to perimeter times the height perpendicular to that perimeter and you'll be using those a lot to calculate volumes and surface areas. Let's talk about cones and pyramids now. Cones, those are basically, they have a cylinder for a base and you can just put some dashed lines in here. Doesn't have to be a perfect circle, usually that's what we're dealing with though, but it doesn't have to be. And then pyramids, they have polygons for their bases. And it could be a triangle, it could be a quadrilateral like this one four-sided. Just like cylinders and prisms, there's one formula to calculate volume of a cone or a pyramid, and it's equal to one-third the volume, or actually I could just say one-third the area of the base times the height. So it's equal to one-third the area of its base times that height and we'll put the little perpendicular symbol to help you remember it's the height perpendicular to the base so like for this cone on the left it would be that height right there that I just drew that dashed line in for the height perpendicular to the base whether it's a right cone like these are where that height the center of the cone the top of the cone or the pyramid is perpendicular to the base or it could be an oblique cone as well, like something like that. So basically, the volume of a cone or a pyramid is one-third the volume of a cylinder or prism into which that cone or pyramid would fit. It's one-third of the volume formula for a cylinder or a prism. Here, we'll extend a prism off of this pyramid over here.
And so that would be the actual prism right there. The pyramid that's inside of that would take up one third of the space or one third of the volume. So there's a formula that you should write down. Volume of a cone or a pyramid is equal to one third the area of its base times the height perpendicular to it. Now for a pyramid, the lateral surface area, the surface area of the sides, it's pretty obvious what you would do there. The sides are triangles, so you just have to figure out the area of each of those triangles and add them up. A cone is a little bit different. It's got this curved surface. Just think of an ice cream cone. There is a special formula for a cone, and we'll just say LSA for lateral surface area of a cone. That's equal to pi times the radius times the slant height. That's this right here, that distance from there to there along the side. Pi r times l. Pi times the radius times the slant height l. That is for a cone, obviously with a circle for its base. It can't have some other curved shape for its base. It has to have a circle for its base. Otherwise it wouldn't have a radius, right? Somebody at some time, I don't know, maybe they were eating ice cream and they made some observations. They used inductive reasoning to come up with this rule. Lateral surface area of a cone equals pi r l. We apply that rule. That's what deductive reasoning is about. We assume that that is true and that that will help us when we want to build something or make something, solve a math problem about lateral surface area. Another good formula to write down in your rule book. Lastly, let's look at spheres. And they have a relationship in here dealing with uh, how to relate a sphere's volume to a cylinder. You can use that one. It's two-thirds of the volume of a cylinder into which that sphere would fit. But we have lots of formulas for circles already. We know that the circumference of a circle is equal to 2 times pi times the radius. We know that the area of a circle is equal to pi times the radius squared. So I just like to keep doing formulas, keep those in mind. The volume is equal to 4 thirds pi times the radius cubed. That's the volume of a sphere. And its surface area, let's just say SA for surface area, put this in your formula book. You might want to write the words surface area out just so you can remember that's what SA stands for. 4 pi r squared. 4 pi times the radius squared. So like I said, one way to calculate volume of a sphere is also by knowing that it's equal to two-thirds the volume of a cylinder into which that sphere would fit. I think the most important one for you to remember is just this formula here. Let's go ahead and do some practice problems now. Here I have the base, what the base looks like for a right cylinder. Now, we call that a cylinder because it has a curve in it. If it didn't have any curves, we'd call it a right prism. So I've given you what the base looks like, and then h equals 3 centimeters. That means the height is 3 centimeters. I want you to find TSA, uh, that's short for total surface area, and I want you to find the volume of this right cylinder. Well, first let's go ahead and find the volume, and let's just think about our rule for finding the volume. So always what we try to do first is think about what information do I know that I can use to solve this problem. Well, the volume is equal to the area of the base times the height perpendicular to the base, which would be 3 centimeters, right? So let's figure out the area of the base. We can use this to find our total surface area as well, right? So that's an important value to calculate. Anytime you're looking at some fairly strange looking geometric shape. Try to break it into shapes that you are familiar with. Don't we have a triangle there? And we also have a sector. We have a 45 degree sector. That's what that other part is. So we have those two shapes that we can calculate the area of. We can assume also 
I didn't put it in there. I just did. There's a right angle box there at the bottom, so we can assume that that dashed line is perpendicular to that bottom side. And so that bottom side of that triangle has a base of 10 centimeters. And its height, think about that. That other part is a sector, so that 8 centimeter side is its radius. That means that dashed line is also 8 centimeters long, so we say 10 times 8 divided by 2. That's the area of that triangle plus the area of the sector would be 45 over 360. That's the fraction of the circ of a circle that that sector would take up. 45 360 times pi times 8 squared, which is the radius. Okay, so we have 10 times 8 is 80 over 2 would be 40. And then figuring out the area of the sector, what I would do is just do 45 times 3.14 times 64 and get that answer and divide it by 360 degrees. If you're doing this on a graphing calculator, you don't want to do 45 divide by 360 times pi times 8 squared. The graphing calculator won't know that that fraction is separate. It'll say that everything to the right of the division sign is in the denominator. That's what the calculator will think. So do everything that the numerator has in it first. 45 times pi times 64 or 8 squared. Divide that by 360 and you end up with 25.12. And so that's going to equal 65.12. Don't forget your units, centimeters squared. So the volume will just equal 65.12 times 3 and that would be 195.36 centimeters cubed because we did length times length times length. Volume is always length cubed. Try to remember that. Your units I think are just as important as your answer on these problems. 195.36 doesn't mean much. 195.36 cubic centimeters does. It tells you how big it is. Now let's figure out the total surface area. Think about what we know here. I'm just going to do it over here to the left. The total surface area, remember that's 2 times the area of the base because you have two bases, top and bottom, plus the lateral surface area. And that's the perimeter times the height perpendicular to it. So if you want to, a good idea is to just draw the three-dimensional representation of this shape. Just to kind of help you remember, oh yeah, I have a top and a bottom base that I'm concerned with here that I have to figure out the total or the surface area of. We already know what the surface area of the base is, 65.12. So we'll just have 2 times 65 point one two plus the lateral surface area. Now that's the more complicated one that we still need to solve for and we have to add up the sides there to get the perimeter and then multiply that times the height of three centimeters. So we say three times thirteen plus ten would be twenty three plus eight would be thirty one and then plus that arc. We have to know what that arc is. That would be forty five over 360 times 2 times pi times the radius of 8 for that arc. And so that's going to equal 3 times 31 plus 6.28 which is equal to 3 times 37.28 And that equals 111.84. Now remember, any practice problems that I do, you're supposed to do them as well. You can always pause the CD, try to work them yourself, and fast forward to the answer and see if you got them correct. Doing a diet CD is not a spectator sport ever. You're supposed to be doing something the whole time. You can watch for a little bit, but you should be writing stuff down, working the problems out yourself. That's the best way to learn them. Not watching me do them, but you doing them yourself.
putting that pencil to the paper. Now that was our lateral surface area that we just figured out. So our total surface area is equal to 2 times 65.12. That would be 130.24. Plus 111.84. And that equals 242.08. What? Centimeters cubed or centimeters squared? It's area. It has to be centimeters squared. And we can't forget our units either. So there's our total surface area. 242.08 centimeters squared. Now let's say we needed a metal part like that, exactly that shape, to fit inside some kind of an engine to relieve some stress and make, make the engine stronger. Could we make it exactly 242.08 centimeters squared of surface area and 195.36 cubic centimeters of volume? Well, no, we couldn't make it exactly, but we would use these rules of geometry in our machine to help us get as close as we could. God is the only one who can make a perfect geometric shape. We can just come close. Okay, look at practice problem B. We'll do one more here. I've given you a base for a cone and a height of 10 meters. I want you to find the volume of that cone. Well, let's think about what we know. What's our rule? Sometimes somebody used inductive reasoning to figure out the volume of a cone they made observations, that's what inductive reasoning is about, and they figured out the volume of a cone was equal to the area of the base times the height perpendicular to that base, one-third of that. We could do it one-third times area of the base times height, or area of the base times the height divided by three. So we need to figure out the area of the base, and look at what we have there. We have a rectangular shape and we have half a circle. I always like to do this when I'm figuring out areas. Break them up into geometric shapes I'm familiar with and draw those geometric shapes and that helps me think about what to do next. I have a rectangle has a width of 6 and a height of 7 and then I have half a circle there. Now how do we know what to do with the circle? Circle is pi r squared, but it's half a circle, so we need to divide by 2. The radius of the circle, we can assume that that dashed line that I have there is the diameter of the circle, and it's the same as 6 meters, so its radius would be 3 meters. Pi times 3 squared divided by 2 because it's half of a circle. That's kind of thinking of a sector as well, right? That's just like 180 over 360ths of a circle. We end up with 42 plus 14.13 if we use 3.14 for our value for pi. And that would equal 56.13. That would be meter squared to be the units. I'm not going to concern myself with writing those right now. Wait till the answer. So the volume of the cone would be 56.13 times that height which was given 10 meters divided by 3. And that equals 187.1 meters cubed, 187.1 cubic meters. Like I said before, it's always a good idea on these, if they don't give it to you to, or even if they do give it to you, just to get some practice thinking about what these shapes look like, go ahead and try to draw a cone. There's the base, kind of do a perspective drawing of the base, and then this side, you kind of have a cone looking shape, maybe like that. And along the back side, then, you need to make that a dashed line because that would actually be a hidden line back there. So the volume of a cone, that's equal to the area of the base times the height perpendicular to it divided by 3. 
Okay, well that's all for lesson two.